The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on the Parex Radio Network. I want to thank everyone uh, for being with us tonight, those in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one of you. Um, tonight I have with us uh, Barbara Duncan. Good evening, everyone. And I have Jeffrey Gould. Hello, hello. And tonight we got a great guest, which uh, I could probably do three hours instead of two with um, a lot of good stuff that's going to be coming. Um, we want to uh, let everybody know that if you do have questions tonight, you can private chat them to either uh, H. Foister or Ceiling Cat, and we will get those answered for you. Uh, so... Because we have uh, a lot of information to try and go over tonight, um, we want to let Jeff go ahead and introduce our guest. Well, tonight's guest is filmmaker Christopher Tillman, writer and director of Legends of the Heartland, Lives and Crime, Life and Crimes of Return Ward, Volume 1. Christopher is the founder of Haunted Toledo and its YouTube channel, for which he is the primary content creator and executive producer for Haunted Toledo's digital streaming and broadcast television content. So welcome, welcome, fellow filmmaker Christopher Tillman. Hi, thank you for having me on. Oh, our pleasure. <laughs> and uh, before we get <clears throat> into the uh, legends uh, of the Heartland, because it's a, a really great uh, story, so we, we want to get into that, but I want to find out a little bit about you, um, how did you get into the paranormal uh, to start with? This, the subject has been with me since I was a kid. Um, I, I, you know, it started with like stories of Bigfoot and um, the ghost didn't, the ghost stuff didn't come along till later because I was scared to death as a kid that, of ghosts. <laughs> um, but like UFOs and Bigfoot and, and just all these weird stories that, um, you would see in the library, th those library books and shows like In Search Of on TV, Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's just always fascinated me that these things are out there, could be out there, you know, what was really going on, things like that. And then it slowly delved into, you know, the hauntings. And is there something after death? Is Can people come back? Um all those stories just started to really fascinate me. And then after high school, I decided I'm just going to go out and start looking for this stuff on my own, you know, and it just really, it grew from there almost to um, the point of an obsession almost. Well, you know, that was me to an extent. Of course, I was always afraid to start with and uh, some people actually, I started watching or I started getting in this site here on Para X in 2008, and the uh, owners at the time got to be good friends with me, and they talked me into going on an investigation with them uh, at the Sorg Opera House. Uh, and I said, who, me? And to a place that's haunted? No way. But they talked <laughs> me into it, and um, after I had did that, um, they, in two months, well, by November of 2008, um, they had talked me into doing this radio show. So I've been doing that since 2008 in the fall. And uh, I now can go places and do things because if you wanted to really understand that there is life after death or ghosts or spirits, when you start investigating and you actually start getting audio on your recorder 
that comes from nowhere. You don't even hear it most of the time when you catch it. And it's it's not put on there by anything other than spirits. And I feel that they're here with us. Um, they're all around. And it's just like they're living their own life, whether it's repeated or uh, they know they have a conscience and know what's going on, which I feel uh, I've, I've got answers before from questions. So that has to be uh, something uh, pointing to that. So did, have you gotten a lot of good audio? Yeah, we've, I, I've heard some EVPs that we've, we've captured that cannot be explained through any other means than, you know, paranormal. Um, these are voices that are, they're very clear. Um, there, there's no, you know, when other people hear it, there's no um, discussion over what's really been said, what's really being said. Everybody hears um, clearly what's being said. And we all know that there was nothing else in the room saying that word or those words. Um, but it, it still mystifies me. How is that possible? You know, what, you know, I, I'm, I believe this stuff exists and now I'm at to the point where I want to know why it exists. I want to know how it exists. Um, how can a spirit put their voice on a, a piece of audio, but our own ears can't pick it up. Um, I'm just, now I'm, I'm, I've gone from, yes, this stuff is real to now I want to know what makes it work. I want to know how it works. And I think that's, you know, I, I think everyone should be asking that question a lot more because that's how we're going to learn to build better, you know, gadgets and gizmos to be able to actually capture this evidence. Um, I, you know, life does go on in some form, some way. Um, so for me, that question's already been answered. Now I want to know, you know, what's it like over there? Why do they come back? Why do they stay here? You got to, you got to figure the afterlife has got to be amazing. You know, it's got to be, you can do almost anything I would imagine. Why would you stick around here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I'd, I'd be out exploring. Going well, or the question is, are, are they here because it exists on, you know, heaven, hell, earth are all the same thing. <laughs> right. I mean, there's yeah. a concept of the singularity that there is no such thing as time on the yeah. other side. There's no such thing as location. It's just. You, it's just everything's there at that moment happening or it it's it's a hard concept to wrap my mind around but i'm very interested in learning as much as i can about it so uh in in that process um are you using a uh, new equipment or are you branching out into say oscilloscopes or um you know full spectrum cameras uh, how exactly are you um, attempting to to quantify well, when it comes to like what we do at Haunted Toledo, the, the focus still remains on the history and the, and the stories and recording people's experiences and trying to document, if we can, some of those same experiences. But then in like what I do off camera, it's I'm getting more into how do we create better gear to do what we do. And I'm, I'm starting to look more towards the microwave portion of the spectrum. Um, I, I think, you know, we got some, we got some good gear now, but it, it, we're stuck looking at the, the radio frequency part of the spectrum. We're stuck looking at the visible and the infrared light part. I think what we really need to be looking at is the microwave portion. Um, because a lot of what, when you, when you look at what happens when people are exposed to microwave radiation, you start to see some of the very same things that people claim to experience when they're exposed to haunting phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a friend of mine who's, who's big into computers and the, the Arduino stuff or how we pronounce that. And he's, he's like, I can build some of this stuff for you. So I'm, I'm putting my pen, my pennies together and we're going to maybe try to build some, some prototype pieces of equipment. Well, from microwave detection, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say we're going like deep into the microwave portion, but we're just, mm -hmm. I think it's right there, right there at the very edge. I think we just need to push a little bit further and we might be able to develop something that is able to hopefully document this stuff better. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people say that when, 
it's a common claim that they'll hear a voice, but they're not hearing it with their ears. They're hearing it in their own head. And there's some patents out there where they talk about voice to skull transmission using microwaves. Yes. So it's like, well, why aren't we looking at the micro? I mean, so that, that's why I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to build some of this stuff or how to, you know, where to find people that could build some of this stuff and how much it's going to cost. And, mm -hmm. you know, is it, is it safe to use, safe to operate this, something like this? Um, because I, I think we can all rest assured that the paranormal does not happen in the gamma part of the spectrum or the x-ray part of the spectrum, because if it did, we'd all be dead. Yep. So um, a little, if we, if we venture just a little bit into the microwave portion, I think that's where we're going to find a lot more answers. Oh, you're just absolutely your right. Yeah. There, there is a lot of technology out there where they're beaming advertising into your heads when you walk down the street so that you are focused on one thought. So it, it wouldn't surprise me. You're absolutely right. Um, now, whether or not they have the technology to actually detect it, I don't know. Um, I'm assuming if they built it to project it, that they built it to detect it as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would think so. Great out of the box thinking. Now, we, we had a, a great friend, uh, Mike Stevenson, known as the Paranormal Man. He's from Maryland. And he was into all this electronic stuff, and he was taking and building things because uh, he would sit there and tell you how they speak to us. It's through thought. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he was real good. He, he unfortunately passed uh, this uh, past year. Uh, and uh, we really hated to see that because uh, he was always with us when we'd go to Gettysburg or uh, when they'd have a convention sometimes over here. Uh, at Post Town, he would come over to that, and um, he was he was into all that real good. And he could sit there and talk to you for hours and show you all kinds of stuff. And I don't know if he still got stuff, if they still got it up on his uh, site called The Paranormal Man, but uh, he would go into all that stuff. And how much he's put on there and it's still there, I don't know. It's, it's definitely worth checking into. Um <clears throat> well, a, a very good read if you can find a copy of this book. Um, and now I can't remember the, the title. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I'm it's, the same it's, way. From, it's from like the 1900, like 1900, 1901, 1902, somewhere in there. Um, it was published by Myers. He was a member of the Society for Psychical Research in London. And he gave one of the most fascinating theories for what ghosts really are um, that much like what what was being said that they they speak to you through energy they they uh, they they contact you through energy and what he basically what it is is like your your mind is a receiver and this paranormal energy is like a transmission and if you're if your mind the receiver isn't tuned to the right station you're not it's, you're not going to even pick up the the transmission you're not going to have any type of experience and if you're kind of on the right station but not you know, you kind of just you're just off the dial a little bit, then you're only going to get partial information. And if you're tuned in right to the transmission, of course, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to see all this information coming through. And so there, like the mind is like this this receiver, and it and when people when people have an experience and they see something, and they're not tuned in just the right way, that the brain kind of fills in the gaps. And that's where we get the archetype of the, the, the phantom lady in white that everybody sees. Um, and and it was, it's just a really cool explanation about what this energy could be and how we perceive it. And he goes on to say that if you do see a spirit in front of you, that you're not really seeing it. Your mind is, is projecting this hallucination because you're dialed into this, this energy and your mind is processing it and it gives you a visual to look at and based on how well you're tuned in to the transmission will depend on how clearly you see the spirit as it's intended to be seen um so some people can go into a haunted building and they'll see like this this uh this woman wearing a, a dark robe and she looks she has long white hair 
and they'll see her very clearly. And then other people go into the building, their mind isn't as tuned in and they, their, bri their, their brain kind of fills in the gaps and they see like the phantom lady in white. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating theory. And as it's, I think that falls in line with like the microwave stuff that we have to develop technology that allows us to really help us tune into what's going on. If, if we can see like a waveform of this energy in the microwave spectrum and we can figure out how to tune into it, maybe we can gather even better uh, uh, EVPs, maybe more clear EVPs. Because um, I think a lot of what we're doing now, we're missing a lot of information, even with like the audio recorders. I think they're just not, they're not up to gathering information like that. So we get these little bits and pieces. Yeah, and uh, earlier you, go ahead, you said uh, whether the audible voices that were heard might be inside the head as opposed to inside, uh, outside of the ear. Uh, I once had a ghost whisper into my right ear to the point I just saw my girlfriend at the time and snuck up on me. And I've also seen investigative videos where a voice will suddenly be heard in the, in the distance of a, of a building and everybody stops because they all heard it. Now, I can understand maybe if one person, it was in the head, but it seemed like it was in the ear. But if multiple people hear it, is that possible that it's not in their heads? Especially yeah. In, in fact, I think if you have like a group experience like that, I, I think that, that is an, that's evidence of like a, a really powerful experience. Um, for, because the way, the way I look at ghosts is like, all right, let's say tomorrow morning you wake up dead, you're a ghost. You, you're like, you'll be like an infant, like a child. You have to relearn how to manipulate the environment all over again. Um, so for a ghost to be able to actually cause vibrations in the air and produce a sound, that's, that's something that it probably would take them a, a long time to learn and they would need a lot of energy to do it. Um, actual physical manifestation of the world like that whether it's moving something or producing vibrations in the, in the air to create sound, that's, that's got to be a lot of, takes a lot of energy, I would think, to do that. Um, so for, for mass experiences like that, yeah, I think you're dealing with something that is definitely paranormal. I mean, definitely. You, I mean, if you're just hearing a voice in your head, you know, there's scientists have, uh, it happens a lot when people are, are in bed. Just as they fall about to fall asleep, they hear a knocking sound, or they hear someone call their name. And scientists say that that's an actual—it's your brain misfiring or something. They're, they're, they have a word for it. So, if you're hearing stuff in your head, then you're always questioning: Did I—is that really something weird going on, or am I just my brain full of my full of me? But if you have like a mass experience like that, where you have two or more people that are experiencing the same thing at the same time, and they all agree that it's the same. You know, it, the experience is the same from one person to the next. To me, that's a, a very powerful um, display of paranormal energy. Well, I've definitely had the experience of, like, being in that twilight, nearly asleep, and heard a voice suddenly shout my name, and it would just jolt me awake. But I'm like, what What was that? I, I, would, I attributed that more to being probable a dream state than anything in the room. Yeah, it, it's weird, because I think... Everybody's had that experience, but it's like, why would my own brain shout my name? You know, it, this doesn't make sense. But scientists say it's a, it's just your brain is <laughs> just playing tricks on you. I guess I don't, I don't know why the brain would do that, but I, I tend to think half the time those things might be paranormal. It's that subconscious going, "Wake up! I'm not ready." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, you never. I know that. Uh, I work with uh, three different uh, mediums that are really good. And we were investigating in this one house um, where there was supposed to be a, a little girl that they keep seeing, and she had done things around the house and stuff. And the three of us were sitting here in the living room uh, looking down the hallway to the back door uh, just asking questions trying to get this little girl to talk with us and I got my recorder going <clears throat> and we're sitting there 
And all of a sudden, the medium said, she's standing right in front of you. I said, oh, okay. So I had my camera next to me. I was getting it ready. I was going to, you know, see if I could take a picture and capture, capture her. And Mark said, honey, can Henry take your picture? And on the recorder, you picked a little girl up saying, I'm smiling. Wow. Now, when you get stuff like that, that's an intelligent because she's responding to the question and, you know, take my picture type thing. Of course, I, I did, but I never captured anything. But we didn't wow. hear it until you played the recorder back. Yeah, there, there's definitely something out there. There's, I mean, it, to me, there's no debate that this stuff is real. It exists. Um, and for whatever reason, some people are more susceptible to it than others. And, um, man, it's just a, a totally fascinating, it's morbid at times, you know, it's really, really morbid at times, but it's just a very fascinating, um, field to pursue study in. Oh, well, we don't know what the subconscious will do. And I just bookmarked to read for later, uh, scientists are now able to, converse with somebody while they're in the dream state. Yeah, I saw that. And so, you know, if if we can do that, and of course it's done audibly, and your brain is perceptive, why not? There's that part of your brain that is awake during the dream state. Yeah. And probably the opposite is true, too. We can pick up that perceptive subconscious stuff um, while we're awake as well. So why wouldn't we be able to pick up auditory information? Right. And when you, when you look at like the EM spectrum, <clears throat> we're only experiencing just such a small portion of it. And we, we only experience what our five senses will allow us to experience. And there's, there's, there's just so much else going on out there that we don't even notice because we were not designed to perceive it. And, I mean, who knows what's, who knows what could be like right next to you right now? You know what I mean? You, you never know. And it's just the possibilities are endless. Well, based on children, I would say that we are all predisposed to be able to sense them. It's just that we're trained out of it. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. In fact, there's a, um, <clears throat> I don't remember the complete passage, but Stephen King mentioned something like that in one of his short stories and it, it just made so much sense that um as you grow older you're you're told repeatedly monsters don't exist you're safe you're fine there's nothing going to get you go to sleep yada 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 and we we train ourselves to ignore these things and to sometimes to the point where we never experience anything like that ever again and then i also believe that um even if you're not like super sensitive to this type of phenomena that the more you go searching for it, the more you go to these locations and explore and, and try to document, I think that over time you can become a little bit more sensitive to it. Um, and that, you know, hopefully you don't draw nothing to you. I mean, I don't, nobody should have an attachment. Nobody should have to deal with that. But um, I think that the longer you're in this field, the, the more sensitive to it you'll get. And I, I think it can return that, that, I'm not going to say it's going to turn you into a psychic or anything, but at least it's going to make you more susceptible to being able to communicate with this stuff. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, uh, pe people always want to seem to think that mankind has evolved to its highest state now, and uh, I'm not convinced that we are. Uh, I'm convinced that we are still um, evolving, and it's very possible that we're developing these senses as well. Not right. that people I mean, weren't psychic before, but... On, on an evolution, evolutionary scale, I mean, I, I would say that we're still... Maybe we're entering our teens in terms of, of a species. Um, yeah, so we're not fully there yet. We're not fully matured yet. So th there's a possibility that at some point we will be able to... Well, now, before we... Sense. Before we get into uh, the video uh, that you made, Legends of the Heartland, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
I've got a couple questions uh, from the chat room, and <coughs> the first one is from Sherry, and she said, um, if multiple people hear an EVP or audible voice, but hear different messages, have you heard of that before? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that happens quite a bit with, with us. Um You'll, you'll play something back and everybody's going to have a different idea of what was heard or you'll hear something in the moment when you're when you're playing it back and then a few days later when you go to replay it again you'll hear something completely different or you won't hear anything at all um, I, and I think that's just uh, it's recorded so it's not like your brain can't process it but it, it's just uh, maybe things he, people hear things differently or they, they have they're expecting to hear what they're hearing maybe based on the questions that are being asked and their knowledge of the legend of, of why they're in that room to begin with um, so that's one of the things we do is like we do play back the EVPs on camera in the moment so that we can continue to that line of questioning, but we, we really don't make a, a firm judgment on the EVP until we, we wait a week or so and play it back. Cause usually you hear something different. Um, it's just one of those weird things. And I, I think it's a more about people's preconceived notions about what they're expecting to hear versus what's actually being recorded. Okay. Um, let's see. I believe I, I had another one here, I believe. Let's see. Um, all right. Uh, she wanted to know, um, I forget exactly what it was we were talking about. She says, is it that we're not designed to or that we've been taught not to? And I would assume um, uh, she was talking about hearing, I guess. I would think that it might be a little bit of both. Um you know, when you look at crowd psychology, it's very easy to get a, a mass group of people to believe what you want them to believe if you drum it into them enough. Um, I mean, Madison Avenue has taught us that with marketing, you know. So you, it's very easy to convince people to, to believe something if you constantly repeat it. But I also think that at the same time, our brains haven't fully, in terms of like, as a species, I don't think we've fully developed the the, the full capacity of our brain. There, there's so much of it that doesn't seem to be used. Um, it's got to be there for some reason. Nature just doesn't create something like the brain and not use 100% of it, you know. Um, be an interesting thing to ask a, a neurosurgeon what they thought, you know. All right. I think uh, if we don't have any more questions right now, uh, we can start talking about uh, this video that you uh, created, uh, Legends of the Heartland. And it is on Amazon. And if you have Amazon Prime, uh, you can watch it for free on Amazon. Excellent, excellent. And it's only part one because you say you got other uh, two other parts that's been made for this right the whole the mm -hmm. whole concept and story was and how you started uh researching it was really fascinating um did somebody contact you and saying we have problems you need to come and investigate or did you pick the story up and then just start investigating it well i, I had uh the early days of the Haunted Toledo page, I would post a legend, a different legend from across Ohio every day. And they would come from just stuff that I would hear in passing or that I would read on a message board or um, from one of the piles of, of clippings that I had on my desk. And it just, I was looking for something to post. And I came across the, the clipping of the newspaper ad and I had remembered hearing about the story. And I just, I posted something on the page wanting to know, does anybody know who the ghost hunting group that investigated this particular diner? Does anybody know who, who they are? 
um, I'd like to talk to them and find out what they experienced. And, um, you know, of course, nobody knew who the group was, but I did get some messages from former employees of the diner, the executive diner, who pretty much confirmed that they had experienced exactly what the newspaper clips were saying. And that from what they heard, it was the, the phenomena was still happening. And then I just, I was off and running. Let's go talk to the employees. Let's go talk to the owner and, and, and get their, their stories on, on camera. And, and it was like a chain of dominoes. One thing led to another with this story. It's just, it, it just, <laughs> it just, it bloomed into this huge story from out of nowhere. Totally unexpected. And you started with the diner. And then you found out that the uh, store or building next door also was having uh, problems. Yeah. It, well, the, with the diner, it, after talking to them, it was like they were written up in a book of Ohio ghost stories. And that led to that story. Then it led to another newspaper article where it talked about a murder that happened on that location. And, that and was, the way they described the murder was just completely off the wall. I mean, to me, it, the way it was described was like somebody has seen one too many horror movies and they've got they built this big legend out of nothing. So to me, that's a red flag. Um, but the, they did mention the names of, you know, the, the victim, Olive Ward and her husband, Return Ward. So you have names there. It can be. It can be traced back through history. You can see if the story is true. And so all this stuff is happening almost at the same time. Um, and I went to, I started researching the story, and there was a book written about the actual murder by a local historian called Murder in Sylvania. And it's a book where she reprints all the Toledo Blade articles that were written about this, this trial. And there's a lot of trial testimony in the book and a lot of, like, exhibit testimony. And then we find out that the murder didn't really happen at Executive Diner. It happened a few doors down where there's an Ace Hardware sitting now. And at the same time, I'm figuring out this, all this information out. The employees at Executive Diner are telling me that the, the employees in the building right next door to them, they're, they're seeing some of the same stuff in their building and they're seeing stuff inside executive diner because um, the diner closed it's only open for for breakfast and lunch so they close in the evenings and when the the girls that work at the salon next door they, they step outside for a smoke break they'll be standing right there in front of the executive diner and they they're telling me they're seeing stuff moving around in the diner they're seeing these wispy figures walking through the diner and pretty soon it's like you see, you step back from all this information, and you're like, "What the hell's going on?" There's, there's a huge story here, and it just kept unfolding from there. So, at what point did you say we have to go in here to investigate? Oh, right off the bat, I mean, I, I want to be able to. I want to see if we can document some of the same stuff. We went to every location that said they were having some sort of encounter. Um, I wanted to be able to get this stuff, as much of it as I could, on video. Um, Executive Diner, Ace Hardware, uh, Rebay Salon we went to, um, Wildwood Anglers, which is next door to Ace Hardware. We caught some amazing EVPs of what we believe is actually Return Ward. And then way down at the Wingate Hotel, which is maybe... 75, 80 yards away, they're claiming they're, they're seeing someone they believe to be Olive Ward in their building. And it's that one didn't make much sense at the time, but it's, it's it, this whole legend is spans this entire downtown Sylvania district. And, it, you know, it, it's just really, it's, just, it's such a fascinating story. It's how are they? How are all these people experiencing all this phenomena that's all they all claim is tied to this murder? And you wonder, are they talking amongst themselves and they're, they want to be a part of the story or are they actually seeing stuff? 
And based on our investigations, I, 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 every building is, there's something going on in each building. So I would give them the benefit of the doubt and say that, yeah, they are probably being visited by Olive Ward and her husband return. Now, when you actually was getting into this, you actually went and started doing research, uh, libraries and all kinds of other different things to check the history. Um, and you found out uh, a whole lot of stuff about the, about the murder and everything, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, how many hours did you have to spend uh, going through documents and researching uh, the history? Um, I would say, well, from the, the end of 2017 all the way, all the way through 2019. I mean, we got the final cut for the, for the documentary done in spring or summer 2020, and I was doing research all the way up to the very end. Um, there were, in the documentary, they show um, trial exhibits of what Return Ward's house looked like and of the piece of jawbone that pretty much convicted him at trial. Those trial documents, I did not come into possession of those until maybe a few weeks before the final cut was done. And there's still documents coming my way. Um, for much of 2018, I was on the phone daily with researchers and historians uh, between here and in Milan, Ohio. And when I told them the story, they just they decided to, to help out on their own and they started digging on their own and they're they're handing me documents. I'm shipping documents back to them. So it's it just a really cool working relationship with all these different researchers and uh, which surprised me because they knew I was. You know, not only was this like a true crime story, but I was also looking at the paranormal side of it. So it was just really thankful that they, you know, that they, they helped out the way they did. And even the little Shiloh Historical Society, um, which is right down the road from where Return Ward used to live before he moved to Sylvania, they uncovered some documents about one of his, his first victims. So just really thankful for all this research help that that came my way and it, it, there's no way it could have been done without all that help so much information was uncovered is it's just incredible now this murder uh, took place like 157 years ago yeah and what you found out was none of the town pretty much was the same as it was back when those murders took place uh, because uh, the house and stuff where he lived was long gone. Uh, there had been a fire that wiped out the biggest part of the town, so you didn't have anything there. But you did come across uh, old documents that showed what the streets looked like back at that time. Right. Um and, and even even those like maps aren't they're not like accurate they're not they're not like a map we would have today it's just a, a guess where different things used to sit um, and so a lot of it's speculation about where exactly his house sat and it, it's there's a couple different ideas of where it's where it sat and it's and basically all the different theories they're just a few feet off from one another so it's really it's like a minor point as to where exactly it was because we know the general area and it's it's pretty much a you know that northern end of ace hardware and a little bit of the store next door um but yeah it's and then and then to find where uh the boarding house he ran uh just outside of shiloh where he he killed two other people um to be able to find where that actually sat um this has just been a, this is like one of my favorite investigations I've ever done because I love the history part of it. I love finding all these details and all these facts and, and these old history books and journals and maps and everything. And I also like the ghost hunting aspect of it. So this was like the perfect storm for me. I just, I love this story. 
it's a tragic story, but I, I love this story. So Return Ward married this girl, Oliver Ward. Uh, they lived in a little cabin uh, there in the town. Um, I understand that, that they never did get along. Uh, apparently she had uh, one or two kids, I guess, and he didn't care mm -hmm. for kids, so she sent him off to live with, with her relatives. Um, things did not get any better, though, with them because uh, they were always arguing. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about the murder, how uh, how he killed her, and and what happened with that? Oh, before you do that, okay, Ken, um, did you investigate whatever happened to the kids? We um, we know that the son went back to live with his father, um, and we're still tracking on those leads. The daughter must have remarried at some point. And we, and we don't know. We, we have to find those, like a marriage record for, to start with. But um, b because of the name change, um, so far she's kind of lost sure. in the, the paperwork right now. Okay. But he didn't get to them. <laughs> no. No, they okay. were fine. They, yeah, they survived. Because okay. it, it sounded like he wanted to kill anybody pretty much that got in his way. Yeah, he was a, a real jerk. You know, he was, and he had that reputation. People knew not to cross him. People knew to, to give him a wide berth. Um, they knew not to get on his bad side. And he just had that reputation. He was like uh, an ogre. They just, he was the town ogre. And he was very unpredictable. When when he was happy he and laughing, and jovial and he would he'd buy everybody around of drinks or whatever he was that kind of guy but if he was if his mood would change just like that snap your fingers his mood his mood would change and when that happened he was unpredictable and so he never had a whole lot of friends and any friends he did have were pretty much the same type of people like him um and so he, when he met olive they knew each other for like three days and decided to get married. And there's a bit of trial testimony where it's hinted that it was more of a marriage of convenience somehow. Um, he was upset, number one, about the kids. He did, did not like kids. And that was always a constant source of, of arguing with them. Um, there is trial testimony that Olive uh, had become pregnant and he had given her something like called white coffee or white tea or something that induced an, abo an abortion. And she's uh, her, her friends went on record saying that she feared for her life staying with him, that it was a mistake to marry him. It seems like she married him because she wanted to. And it seems like he married her for some other reason. Um, like there was maybe a financial motive to it. I, we, I've never gotten to the bottom of that, but it's just trial testimony that Return was mad at Olive's family that you know they misrepresented who she was and and she's she's you know and he was just upset. That almost seems like an arranged marriage. I got that feeling just from reading that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they argued all the time, and you know the the houses were close together back then. The walls were thin, and everybody would remark that, you know, the wards are fighting again and they could just hear, hear him screaming. And it ended up, she, she sent her kids away. She feared for their lives and she feared that, um, the abuse that he heaped onto her, that he would one day start to focus on her kids. And so she sent them away. And once she did that in her mind, the marriage was done. You know, he, he, he had made her, you know, separate from her own children, it, it, it's done, it's over. And she left and went back to Adrian. And he spent a week between him and the help of a friend trying to convince her to come back. He gives her the old, you know, I'm a changed man routine and it'll never happen again. You come back and things are going to be great and I'll treat you right, yada, yada, yada. And she finally does agree to come back. And 
they're back to fighting <laughs> again. They're just fighting all over again. And for some reason, she tells him that the only reason she came back was to gather whatever belongings she left, had left behind the, in the first place, that she's not staying. And that's pretty much when Ward decided she's never leaving that house alive again. And when she was in the morning, she was, you know, packing up her things and she was getting her, her shoes on and getting ready to head on out to the train to head back to Adrian. He grabbed a, a smoothing iron. He was a tailor. And a smoothing iron is basically just like, like the electric irons we have now, but they would put them on the, the hot coals to warm them up. And he just grabbed the iron and he, he clobbered her right there on the, on the side of the head. And according to his confession, he just stood there and watched her bleed out for like 15 minutes and just stood there staring at her. And he knew that he had a real big problem on his hands now. The house is right there on, on Main Street, and it's the busiest part of, of, of the street. And he can't just carry the body outside to dispose of it. People would see it. So he's got to figure out how does he cover this up? How does he hide this? And on top of that, the size of his house was 16 feet by 20 feet. It's like the size of a bedroom. So how are you going to hide this body? And uh, his confession, when he described what he did, uh, it's the most gruesome thing I've ever read. Uh, it's it's a very clinical, the way he, he tells what he did, the incisions he made, why he made them. It, it, it sounded like he was describing how to field dress a deer. Um, very cold. And he just decided he was going to dismember the body and burn the pieces in the, the stove right there in the living room. And he went into great detail about every, just about every cut and why he made the cut. And he, went, he, he goes into detail about how some organs burn better than others and how he's curious that, you know, if you don't poke the intestines, they'll explode from the heat. And it's just like he's learning something and he's, he's sharing what he's learning with, with the police. It's just, it's a very, it's just a, it's just the most surreal thing you've ever read. And people remember, um, hearing like chopping noises late at night coming from his house. They recall hearing or seeing columns of black smoke coming from his chimney stack. And this was a February that was very mild. And not a lot of people had to burn very hot fires to keep warm, but they kept seeing Ward coming back from across the street. Um, there was like a wagon repair shop across the street. And he got a lot of his wood shavings for the stove from this, this shop. And they would remark they've seen Ward go back and forth a couple times a day getting buckets of wood shavings. And they always wondered, why does he need it so the fire so hot? What's he doing in there? And the columns of black smoke coming from the chimney and the smell of burning meat. And people just knew something was up between not having seen Olive in a couple days. Return Ward is, is giving um, different stories for why she's gone to different people. And then they, they knew something happened. And knowing Return's reputation as being an unpredictable, violent man, they knew there was some kind of foul play going on. And it, it, it was, they didn't have a police force back then. So it was like one guy, it was his, one guy was like a magistrate. And then one guy was like, he, he did um, law enforcement duties. And so it was a matter of getting everybody together and uh, getting to the bottom of it in terms of what happened to Olive. In fact, the morning, the, the, right after he, he killed her, he wrapped her up in a blanket and put her under the bed. And the first thing he did is he went to the store and he told the, the shopkeeper that, you know, if you don't hear from, if you don't see me or Olive, it's because we're, we're going on a trip and we'll be gone for a while. And then later on in the day, he told somebody else that Olive decided she was going to move to California because she met some man out there. And so it doesn't take long for a town the size of Sylvania at that time to start comparing notes and realizing that, you know, there's something fishy going on. 
but yeah, he would he he burned pieces, the pieces of his wife, in the stove. Then he would then take the ashes, and like in the Shawshank Redemption, when Andy Dufresne is is emptying out the dirt from the tunnel he was digging into the yard, the the prison yard, walking around, leave a little pile here, a little pile there. That's pretty much what Return Ward was doing, just leaving little piles of ashes wherever he went. And some of the bones that were too big to burn, he kind of ground them down as best he could, and he would fling those like in the woods. Um, he would he would throw them in the creek, and he would throw them over by a train bridge that still stands to this day. Um, so that that's that's how we he was able to get rid of the body, except for one piece, and that's what that that piece is what what got him arrested. Now, from the time he had killed her, was there uh, another killing that he did uh, from a traveling salesman or something like that? Or was that before she, before he married Olive? Yeah, that was before he married Olive. That was before um, even his uh, second marriage. Um, he killed two, two people that he, he confessed to, but there could be others. Um, from his days when he lived in a place called Richland, which was just, it used to be just outside of Shiloh, Ohio. And that area now is just nothing but cornfields. But he had a, a boarding house that he ran there. And the first person he killed was a shopkeeper named Noah Hall. And he had a general store in Richland. And back then, instead of like, like what stores nowadays, they get a delivery every day of stuff they want to sell in their store. In those days, they would they would take their wagon out east to like New York City or Philadelphia or Boston, and they would buy their goods there and then bring them back to their store to sell them in the t in town. And they would make that trip at least once a year. And he knew from talking to Noah Hall that he was out, he was getting ready to make a trip um, to out out east, and. Noah Hall even mentioned he had like $800 saved up to go and, and buy all the stuff necessary to sell in his store for the coming year. And back then, $800 is, to, in today's money, would be like maybe 23, 23000 somewhere in there. And so Return Ward decided he's going to kill Noah Hall and take his money. And that's exactly what he did. And he tried to frame a pair of brothers in town as being the ones that did it because they were known for being um they were known for burglary and stuff like that they were known for all kinds of petty crimes um but not so much murder and they didn't have enough evidence to convict them and people began to suspect that ward was the one that did it but they just had no evidence to put him on trial and then a year later a traveling uh tin peddler came to town and got a room for the night at Ward's boarding house. And this guy uh, was selling like tin plates, tin silverware, tin cups, stuff like that. And, and probably some other stuff too. But um, Ward uh, had dinner with the man. They retired to a sitting room, had cigars and, and were just talking. And then the, and then the, the tin peddler, the, the only name that we're given is Mr. Lovejoy. Um, Lovejoy went into his room for the night because he had to get up and start down the road again in the morning to sell some more of his stuff. And Ward sat awake in his bed thinking, you know, he's a traveling salesman. He's probably got some money on him. Um, who's going to miss him? You know, if he comes up missing, nobody's going to know what happened to him because back then Ohio was like the frontier. Um, if you came up missing, people just assumed it was the natives that got you, or you you ran afoul somewhere, or maybe you, the, the the buggy ran off the road somewhere and you died in a ditch. Nobody knows. So this is the perfect opportunity for him. And he ended up killing Lovejoy. Didn't get any hardly anything for. I think he made like twenty five bucks. So he ended up taking a lot of the tin items that he was selling for himself, and then he he amputated the peddler's legs so he could fit into like a shipping crate. He loaded that shipping crate onto a wagon and traveled about 60 miles north to his father's farm 
uh, on the Huron River and just chucked the crate into the river. And uh, everybody kind of suspected he did it or that something was foul because Ward had a, a, um, a, a young lady worked as like a housekeeper sort of thing. And she had come in uh, the next day for work and, wor- and she was going to go make up the, the, the Mr. Lovejoy's room for the next tenant, and get it ready. And Ward's like, no, you don't need to. I already took care of it. And she thought this was kind of weird because Ward had never done something like that. It was always her job. He would never, he would never bring himself to doing something like that. So she went up and checked anyway to be sure and, and then immediately left the building and did not return to work ever again. She saw something, but she never described what she saw. So he, there, he missed something in his cleanup um, after killing that guy. And he left town after that and made his, started making his way to Sylvania. Um, as far as I know, nobody, if I'm sure there was a, an investigation into what happened to Lovejoy, but we haven't found those records. And it was maybe 15 years later or so that Richland itself was wiped off the map. Um, they describe a windstorm came and just like decimated most of the town. And I'm assuming that meant a tornado. Um, so it, it's pure speculation as to what she might have seen, but it was enough to spook him to leave the area and and head north and hopefully try to outrun the law, which he did. For that one so it sounds like he really had the makings of being a full-blown serial killer he had but a, a very stupid one um he didn't seem to cover his tracks very well right uh, it, he was it i got the impression reading his confession that he he was cold-blooded to do it he didn't really care about you know he it didn't bother him taking a life what it's almost as if like after the act was done, that's when he snapped to reality and it's like, Oh crap. I, you know, what do I do now? You know, I, he didn't plan it out. Now he's got to deal with the aftermath of it and hope he can, you know, make it go away so that nobody knows. Um, it, he's, he's just a, a, a bumbling serial killer. If you, <laughs> if you can call him that. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that, he made a mistake when he was marrying Olive because she seemed to have a lot of friends and very social, whereas he was the exact opposite. So I'm sure there was a lot of people who who knew what was going on eventually, um, you know, and, and we're going to look out for her. Yeah, and she was very well liked, and so it was it, it was noticed right away that. There's no way, you know, she had already mentioned that she doesn't feel safe with the guy. And now he's telling people that they're going on vacation or that she's left and, and moving away. She didn't, Olive never said goodbye. It, it just didn't make sense to anybody. They knew something was up. And, you know, they just had to figure out how they were going to find out. How, how were they going to bring justice to this woman? Um and, and like I said, his house was 16 by 20, and they searched it twice. And even though they found spots of blood here and there, they didn't really find anything that would really hold up in court or that would answer any of the questions they had. Um, it wasn't until the final search of the house where they uncovered the evidence they needed to have him arrested um and and even during the first couple searches they did find a lot of ash in the stove they found um some small bones in the stove and he was able to uh, just talk his way out of it you know he said no those are chicken bones um i guess that was a, a common thing to do back then was when you're done eating anything with bones in it you just throw the bones in the in the stove and just burn them away um so he, he had a he had an answer for every question they had. And even though they didn't really trust the answers, they really had nothing else to go on to try and, and you know, arrest. I mean, he was arrested once, but they let him go because there just wasn't evidence. Um, one of the things that really helped him 
was the one time they took him into custody, they sent somebody to Adrian to go look for Olive to, you know, say that, yeah, she, she's back home. She's alive. He's, he didn't kill her. Well, this guy came back and said, yeah, he saw Olive. He didn't talk to her, but he saw her. And it was, it was obviously misidentification um, because they let him go. And once they let him go, Ward went into overdrive, getting rid of the body and, and getting the ashes uh, spread out everywhere he could. Um, so it was between his bumbling behavior and a lot of, you know, luck that came his way that he made it as far as he did. He just overlooked one key piece of evidence and that's what, that's what got him hung. So there's a, a couple of things in there from your estimation would be a cause of a haunting. One is residual from the fact that they probably had a lot of energy going back and forth, doing their daily routines while they were living together, etc. And the other would be after the fact when he was trying to dispose of the body, <laughs> uh, ashes, etc. Yeah, you can you can almost imagine um, what was going through his head as he knew he's sitting in his house with a dead body or pieces of a dead body, and he knows the people outside those walls are looking at him knowing he did it. You know, he, he knows that he, his time is limited. They'll be coming for him any minute. I mean, the amount of stress that he's under, um, it's, it's gotta be off the charts. And that type of energy, that mindset, um, yeah, I would, I would say that could definitely leave a heck of an impression on an environment that could still be felt to this day. Um, in fact, uh, in the 1930s, uh, a, a guy who was a kid prior to the great fire in Sylvania had written a letter describing what Sylvania looked like, um, prior to the fire. He went through and he listed all the different buildings and, and what business was in the buildings. And he came to, uh, return Ward's house and he, he said that, um, this is where the Taylor Taylor lived that killed his wife and and kids back then knew to stay away from the house otherwise the ghosts would come out and get you so and this is like 1880s that this you know he remembers this from as a kid so just 30 years after the murder there's already a ghost story circulating um now whether it's just kids trying to scare each other or not or if there's actual actual sightings um, we don't know, but yeah, the, the the amount of arguing and the yelling going on in that house, the tension and the stress, and then the murder, and then what he went through mentally. I mean, when you think about what it takes to dismember a human body and burn it and cut it up, and that's got to take a toll, no matter who you are, if you're a psych psychopath or not. It's got to take a toll on on you mentally, and that's got to that energy goes straight into you know the location around you the ground the wood you know everything it's just it just permeates everything it's this dostoevsky would love this story <laughs> yeah. crime and punishment down to a t of not just the murder but the psychological effects afterwards and the imprint that's going to make um it, it, it's, it's got to be fascinating if anybody did a study of his behavior after the murder. You know, did he talk to, how many people did he talk to, um, what was his demeanor, and etc. Can you imagine this, even being a psychic around that sort of energy would be? Ugh. Well, there was it's limited uh, information about his time in jail. Um, you know, I, he was obviously worried about the outcome of, I mean, he, I, I do remember something about he was upset that people were making fun of him. <laughs> that the, oh, I wish I could remember the story now. Um, he was being teased in jail. Oh, hell, I can't remember the story. <laughs> um, but he, yeah, he, he was, he's the perpetual victim. Everybody's against him. Um, and I think by the time he made it to prison or jail, Lucas County Jail, 
he had probably gone into like a, a survival mode. So he wasn't even really feeling the effects of what happened, um, of what he went through. Um, and then it was, uh, when he made his confession, he was told by his lawyer, do not confess because he actually had the support of the public behind him. There was during the trial, the, the piece of jawbone that they found, um, it wasn't a full intact jawbone. And there was enough defense witnesses saying it could be, you know, it could be a dog bone, part of a dog jaw. It could be this. It, it, we, and even the prosecution witnesses could not state uh, 100% if that was a human jawbone. Um, so because of that evidence and because of um, no body, no crime, it's, it, it almost looked like he was going to get off. Um, and he was told not to confess by his lawyer. And it was, you know, the old, um, you would hear about the, the, the dime novels back then that were popular, like Billy the Kid and Jesse James. Mm -hmm. And one of those publishers came to him for his story and he just, he couldn't resist. And he gave a full confession and that's pretty much what got him the death penalty. It, it turned the public sentiment against him. Um, yeah, the only way until he was acquitted. Well, he would have been sentenced. I think he would have. I think he would have gotten away with life, or maybe you know, whatever life. It, it, I don't think life meant their full life in prison, but whatever. Well, I think he. I don't think he would have gotten um, an execution out of it. Um, but the uh, the confession pretty much damned him to hang at the at the Lucas County Courthouse. Wow. Uh, now, how, how long was he in jail for? Oh, not long. The The trial started in March. I think it ended. Yeah, I think the whole trial lasted for March. And then he was hung June 12th. So there were wow. there were no lengthy appeals processes or sitting on death row or anything. It was, you know, you're guilty. We're going to schedule a date and you're done. Wow. Wow. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and take us a quick break. It'll be about uh, five, six minutes. So just remember the mic's live, and uh, we will be back then. We will take a quick break, so stay tuned, everybody. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, para -X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight, those in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one of you. And we got with us uh, Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And speaking of listeners... Uh, where do we have listeners at tonight? Uh, all over the United States, across the pond in England, and the other side of the big drink, uh, Australia. All right. Well, that's pretty good. Oh, Canada, yeah. All right. And we have with us Jeffrey Gould. Uh, hello. And our great guest tonight, Christopher Tillman. Hi. Thank you. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Um, we've been talking uh, about uh, the video, uh, Haunted Leg or Legends of the Heartland. Now, this is only volume one. You're going to be creating a volume two and a volume three, right? Yeah, that's, yep, that's right. We want to try and tell... Um, as much of this guy's story as we can uncover. And it looks like right now it's going to be a, um, a trilogy of sorts. Yep. Volume two will deal with his second known victim. And then volume one or volume three will deal with, uh, his, his first victim. Wow. Yeah. So ahead, let Bob. me ask, do you think that, um, in telling these stories, um, that if 
if he is hanging around and watching all of this, do you think that that would uh, sate his appetite and have him move on? Or do you think that it would fuel even more of an anger? I mean, have you noticed um, in investigating just the um, Sylvania area that has activity even increased? It, I am hearing that it's still going on. Um, and I've, I've, since the documentary came out, I'm, I'm hearing that from other stores around those stores that they're they're having weird stuff happen. But it, it's hard to tell if they're just jumping on the bandwagon to be a part of the story or, or if there's actually something legitimate going on. Um, but at this point, I'm hearing that the places we've been that do seem to be um, the epicenter for this, this whole story, that they are still having... Um, unexplainable things going on nothing that really wants you know has them running from the building but stuff that just creeps them out on a general basis um reve uh, the salon is that's uh, the only place that has ta- that has talked about hearing what sounds like an angry man and back in one of the spy areas um th- they say it sounds like there's either two men that are yelling at each other or at least just one man who's just yelling about everything. Um, So I do think he's wandering around still. I think Olive is definitely wandering around still. And one of the theories that we came up with to try and explain why all these different locations are experiencing similar phenomena is that Olive is still running from Return Ward. He's still chasing after her, and she just goes from one building to the next, you know, trying to keep away from him and, you know, constant, just constant running, trying to hide from him, Um, which is sad. Um, And I I don't see that. I think the activity is pretty much going to stay the same. Um, It just depends on if the people in these buildings give any attention to it, um, which, um, you know, a lot of the employees are telling me they just don't, they don't, they try to not to pay, pay attention to it. Um, it's just, it's just a sad story. And I think, uh, when you look at like from, from a lot of these bu- businesses, they were other businesses at one point and people come forward uh, time after time and, um, it seems like these stories have been going on for a while, so it's I, don't, I just don't I, I don't yeah. think that it's going to ramp up or I don't even think it's going to go away either um, Olive doesn't seem like she really notices when people are around It's okay. it just seems like Return Ward is the one that notices when people are around Okay. Is it possible Olive is a residual haunting and just an imprint? That could be it too. Yeah. Because she doesn't really seem to interact with anyone. It just, it's the classic, um, you know, I, I looked down the hallway and saw this phantom lady walk across the hall. It, it doesn't, it just seems like Olive is oblivious to her surroundings. Hmm. But Return Ward, that's, that's who we got. I think if we're going to name your kid Return, I think that's just going to cause problems anyway. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yes. Odd name. Odd choice of names back then. A very odd name. (laughs) But it seems to me, have you, I don't know if your group employs psychics at all. Has anyone attempted to communicate with her to figure out if she is just a residual or is in some sort of death denial? Um, Sarah Shelton is, I wouldn't call her a psychic, um, but she is definitely sensitive and she's able to somehow gather information about a location that you wouldn't gather through normal means, if that makes any sense. Um, so I guess she's about as psychic as a, is, I guess she would fit the bill. Um, but during our investigations, it just didn't seem like she could tell that there was something there. 
she could smell perfume. Um, she got a sense of like a feminine presence, but it didn't seem like it was noticing her. It, it wasn't until Return Ward in, in Reve Salon and then at Wildwood Anglers that um, she, she was able to get some kind of uh, communication with him. And I'm not sure if that's because he, it, you know, it might have been just because it was a woman who dared to talk to him. You know, we don't make use of uh, any type of uh, provoking or anything. But when it comes to a guy like Return Ward and what he did, I figured, you know, if you, however you want to talk to him, you go right ahead, you know, and she was able to get responses from that. And um, he definitely seems to be aware of his surroundings and aware of what's going on and, and who's in the room. And it's just with Olive, I don't think she could be residual, but... I've, I've never heard of a residual haunting like that showing up five different places. Yeah. Um, I, I think maybe. I, th- I think maybe she isn't. She might be in denial, but she just she just seems oblivious to her surroundings. Wow. What a way to live out eternity. Yeah. <laughs> so when you start investigating this um, obviously you went to a lot of, of uh, background information I don't know if that occurred before or after you started uh, investigating this area um, does that help you map out and plan your investigations because I assume this is a long term study that you're doing yeah this this was many years and, and a lot of the research we would get um at the same time we were investigating or we would get it if we were lucky a couple hours before and then some of the stuff we would get after the fact um like wingate uh wingate hotel i I was always like you know why would olive appear at at the wingate hotel which is like a football field away from the site of her death it just doesn't make any sense and it wasn't until after the investigation that I reread his confession. I'm like, oh, right, you know, right there in his confession, he says he threw parts of her bones in the creek, which is right behind Wingate Hotel. So, um, if if you're the if you believe that a spirit will appear wherever their remains have been spread, then that makes perfect sense of why she would be there. So it was normally I like to have all the research done before I go to a location, and before, and because I I, I tend to view Sarah as being a type of sensitive I won't even tell her what that research is um, I, I, I'll just skim over the legend I won't give her all the details just to see what she can pick up but because of the unique nature of this and that it covered so many properties um, research and investigation was being done simultaneously and, and so it, it, it was a lot to handle um, and a lot to keep straight um, I wouldn't I wish that I would have had the time to research everything beforehand but it just wasn't just wasn't possible based you know trying to get into these locations and and to schedule something that we could have the building to ourselves and and just because of all that it, it just we couldn't do the research first we had to do it as we were going wow now, As a documentary style filmmaker, you are kind of stuck in that thousands of hours of filming <laughs> that you're doing yeah. for this. Yeah. Uh, were you met with any resistance to this, or are people just finally glad that someone is taking them seriously enough to want to investigate all of this? The, the people that have experienced stuff are definitely glad that someone's listening. And which is, that's always a good thing. Um, the locations are, you didn't, re- you didn't really have to talk them into it. They were like, yeah, let's do this. Let's tell this story. And they were kind of, um, one of one of the locations was kind of creeped out that their building was associated with it. But um, but they, they got on board and, and Sylvania, that business community, that, that downtown district, it's all like a tight family. And so they all wanted to, 
help tell this story because it's a part of Sylvania's history, as gruesome as it is, and um, even the, the historical society um, that let us film in some of their historical buildings uh, for the reenactments. Um, yeah, they were, everybody was was just you know excited to be on board to help tell this story. And which was amazing to me because again, it was, you know, I made it clear to them that, you know, not only is this history, but we're also going to do a ghost hunt. <laughs> so um, do you want to be a part of that? And yeah, they, they couldn't wow. wait. So that was, um, yeah, that was refreshing <laughs> that even historians <laughs> will be like, okay, yeah, ghost hunt. They, you know, they'll ignore that part, but let's do the history. You know, <laughs> it was just cool. How many hours did you spend um, doing this the far part one of your um, your documentary there? Oh, it's I don't even know if I can calculate that. It's uh, see, we started like 2017. We started, and we didn't really we didn't have we well we got everything filmed by. 20, the end of 2018 and then 2019 we were trying to figure out how to tell this story and to tell it in a way that people would, would, wouldn't get lost um, and I don't really think we accomplished that but we, I think we came close and uh, 2020 was just a matter of finding the sponsorship to get it aired on you know, the local PBS station so I would say about maybe a year and a half worth of actual work went into this and with me, it's, you know, every day I'm thinking haunted Toledo stuff. Every day I'm thinking about editing and, and research and everything and, and telling these stories and finding locations. So it's, I would consider like a full-time job <laughs> that, that many hours. So the, uh, the restaurant was the first place that said we got activity and wanted you to come in to investigate. And then yeah. they told you that the people next door to Salon is also having paranormal activity. So did you go yeah. over there and talk to them, and did they want you to investigate their place? Yeah, we, when everyone we talked to, we told them, you know, you know, number one, did you know about about Return Ward and this murder? And then did you know that, you know, there's there's stuff uh, that's supposed to be said going on in your building or um, and that we were putting together this, this little documentary about it? Um, Reve, uh, we were able to find the person, the employee that had witnessed something, seen something like a wispy type figure moved through the diner after it was closed, saw it moving through the diner through the wall to where that separates, you know, between the diner and Reve. Um, we were able to find who that employee was and talk to them and get their experience. And then they were able to help us talk to the owner of the building uh, and the owner of the business to get us in there. So it was a lot of networking um, and stuff like that took months to cultivate and, it's it and we in it's like one of those things where you have five different locations and you can't really tell the story unless all five are on board. So it was it was touch and go um, with a lot of the negotiations. Um, executive diner was on board, and uh, um, Ace Hardware was on board. Then we got Reve to, to to be a part of it and uh, Wingate Hotel when we told them about we we heard about their claims from a, a book of Ohio ghost stories and we went to talk to them about it and then they decided that you know in, in March of 2018 they'd shut down the fourth floor for us so we could film there and then Wildwood Anglers was it, before they moved in it was an empty storefront and we were able to talk to the owner and said that while it was empty, we could go ahead and go in there and film for what we needed because we, we wouldn't be interfering with any type of business going on. So it was all just a lot of luck and and networking with the right people to get this story told. Now, I noticed um, when you was talking to the people from the hair salon, they mentioned that there would be kids playing, or they thought was kids, playing in the elevator. Yeah. 
And did they ever see any of the kids spirits or it was just assuming that they thought it was kids no they never witnessed anything um in terms of like a childlike apparition um the one that came closest to it was she was hearing kids playing uh in one of the hallways in the basement and as she turned the corner there was nothing there and the sound stopped um that's like the closest they've come to maybe witnessing some kind of childlike spirit but the weird thing about the, the weird thing about this entire story is the presence of child apparitions uh Reve is is hearing them um executive diner they say they've heard what sounds like children in their basement and then the wingate hotel they have a, a what they believe is a child uh, boy that they've seen in the building um and we're not sure where these child spirits come into play in terms of this legend. Um, because Return Ward and Olive had no children, um, together at least. And uh, Ward came, uh, Ward had a, a newborn daughter from his second marriage who died uh, mysteriously along with the mother. And he didn't admit to it, but I think he killed him. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the child ghosts come from when it comes to this story. Were there missing children um, stories from that time period? Oh, I'm sure there was. I'm sure there are plenty of them. Yeah. Oh, and interestingly enough, um, at his trial, one of Ward's neighbors, um, he had this little story to tell about how you know his one of his first encounters with Ward. Um, uh, this neighbor had a couple kids, him and his wife, and I guess the kids, you know, they're rambunctious, they're outside playing, having a good time goofing off, and Ward came out of his house and yelled at him to, to stop and be quiet and go away. And this went on for quite a bit. Ward's always yelling at these kids, you're making too much noise, yada, 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 right? And the family one day comes home from, you know, the store maybe or wherever, and they see this cookie sitting on the stoop leading up to their house. And one of the young kids goes to reach out and grab it, and his, his dad stops him. He says, you know, don't eat that. You don't, know where, you don't know what it is or where it's been. The family dog came up and ate the cookie, and within minutes was dead. Wow. And Ward was known when, when his house was searched. They found bottles of poison in his house. Hmm. And so this guy, he, he doesn't have proof, but he just he believes Ward – set that cookie there, a poison cookie for his kids. Wow. That you don't, you don't Ward hated that, kids that much. You don't think that they could have been uh, from uh, Olive's kids who knows that she, her spirit's there, so the kids' spirits are there playing? Maybe. Um I don't know. I don't think, I don't think her kids really experienced as much of the abuse as Olive did. I think she got them out of the house in time. Um, and it's a possibility. Um, Sarah believes that the kids show up just to torment Ward because he hated them so much. <laughs> so maybe that's his, maybe that's his punishment in the, in the afterlife is to, <laughs> is to be around kids. I don't know. Well, now, it's it's just it's it's weird that they. These locations are saying they have child spirits, and we just can't find a reason why they're there. Well, you know that there was the fire that wiped out that part of the town. Right. Did Was there any mention that some kids got burned up in that fire? No. Um, in fact, the, the one article I read um, the day after, the day or two after the fire happened, um, it was... It, it, it was a fast spreading fire, but it wasn't so fast that people didn't have time to run back into their homes and gather belongings to try and save. Um, so uh, the fire was out of control, but nobody died. And um, people had time to at least grab some of the most, more important items out of their homes before they burned down. Yeah, but we, they had, nobody died that, we, that was listed in the paper. Wow. Huh. 
it's yeah it's that's a fascinating um artifact of this whole <laughs> story is the children yeah uh, and there may not be any connection whatsoever and it may be a whole different story but we you know the off. theory that when I guess um, if if you're a northbound spirit or you're trapped here or whatever you're going to go to where people where other spirits are maybe uh, are you going to go to, you know, if you notice that there's a, a, a living person who can somehow see or sense spirits, you're going to go to be around them. Maybe they'll see and sense you and you know what I mean? So maybe they're there for that reason. Um, or maybe it's a whole different, um, a whole different story going on, but because they're being, you know, they're being seen in three different spots yeah. and Ward and Oliver being seen in, in all these different spots. I'm, I'm, something tells me that maybe the kids are somehow involved with the story, but we just don't know yet, mm-hmm. and that they're traveling around just as much as Olive and Return are. Have you started work uh, or filming on the other two volumes, the other two murders, and are you noticing child apparitions there as well? We haven't started um, volume two yet. We're going to start after the spring runoff. Um, we got a we got a big surprise coming for what we're going to try and do. Um, uh, and that focuses on Mr. Lovejoy and, and the body, and uh, uh, his body was thrown in the river. And um, we're working with the owners of the lot where his boarding house used to stand to get permission to go there and film um, both in the day and doing like a an outdoor ghost hunt type thing at night. Um, and I want to see if we can work with the historical society there in the area to maybe with metal detectors, try and look for any type of, you know, remains from that building from what it used to stand. Um, I know that at one point it was a cornfield and, or some kind of um, a farm field. And now it's just like an overgrown lot that's filled with like scrap brush and everything like that. So the chances of finding something are pretty slim, but I think it'd be interesting to see if we can pull up anything from the past there, you know, even a handful of nails, maybe some coins, you never know. Um, and then volume three will deal with Noah Hall and his murder. And we just, with the help of Shiloh's historical society, we just located where his grave is, wow. where he was buried. And that happens to be on private property. And, um, and that property now is a farm field, and we're not exactly sure where the grave is. Um, we have the the old newspaper record. We we kind of have some stuff that we can look at for in terms of like, uh, you know, look for this look for the old oak tree by you know the this you know the bridge. We we have a, a general area to look, but we don't really know exactly where yet. So when when you guys were investigating. Did you ever catch any audio of kids while you were investigating? No. No. Um, Executive Diner. We heard some weird stuff in the basement. We heard what the employees tell us was like banging noises. Um, I was able to, to debunk that as being that's the ice maker, the ice machine in the basement. Um... EVPs have been recorded there uh, since. There's another uh, ghost hunting group that has gone there. They have recorded some kind of EVP. Um, but when I was there, no, there was there was really nothing noteworthy going on. Uh, Ace Hardware, um, nothing, nothing with uh, children in it. Uh, Wingate, no. Reve. Reve was totally a return ward location. Um, he was the main, I believe, the main spirit that was active there. And then Wildwood Anglers, we recorded EVP of what um, we believe was Return Ward answering direct questions. Well, you mentioned grave sites. Um, and I'm curious. I know that people sometimes erect gravestones in a cemetery when there is no body. Is there a grave site for 
Olive, um, and is there a grave start for Ward or return? And have you visited them? And do you have, is there any activity there at all? Because um, for Olive, Olive, we're not sure exactly where her gravestone is um, or if anything was erected. Um, I would imagine something, some kind of a memorial marker was made. Um, the, what little we've been able to find about her family, it seemed like they were um, a poor family. Her father looks like he was a carpenter. Um, I'm not sure how much money they made uh, to be able to afford markers and stuff. There is a grave for an olive ward, but we can't see the dates on it. We can't see um, what the years were, so we're not really sure it was hers or not. Um, and it would go by her, her one of her maiden names. She was uh, Bickford was her maiden name. Um, and then Davis was her from her first marriage. And then uh, I don't think their family would erect a name, would erect a plot with uh, Ward's name on it. I think they would yeah. either, it would be Davis or, or Bickford. Um, and that's an return, Adrian. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Coldwater. We found Coldwater. A, we found a grave marker for her in Coldwater. Um, and we found some records of uh, Bickfords that live in Coldwater. Um, it's just a matter of using. Uh, genealogy to uh, try and trace who, who you know where her family roots are and with the lockdown and everything it's getting down to the library downtown into their yeah. research room has just been it's just been no luck yeah. um, for Ward uh, he when after he he hanged um, his body was given over to the Catholic Church and at that time there was only two there was a, a German speaking church and an English speaking church. So we just assumed that he would be given to the English speaking church and the cemetery that that church controlled at that time was Mount Carmel. And so we think he's buried there. Um, talking to the Toledo diocese, they said he would be uh, buried in a part. There's a, in a Catholic cemetery. There's always a part of the cemetery that isn't consecrated. Um, and that's for, you know, criminals. Uh, they don't get to be buried in sacred ground. So that he, if he is there, he would be buried in that part of the cemetery reserved for people like him. And he would have been given probably a wooden marker with his, with his prisoner ID on it. I doubt it would have his name on it. And that's where, that's where he would sit. He wouldn't even be blessed when they put him in the ground. So he's there somewhere I believe the Catholic Church here in Toledo the records that they have going that far back were lost to a flood and Mount Carmel's uh, records are are gone as well so trying to figure out if he's actually in the cemetery and exactly where his plot would be um, we have to find a different way of figuring that out because any official records are gone yeah, he would have been in a potter's field, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, more than likely you're not going to get much, unfortunately. And it could be, and that was also a time period when, you know, cholera was really blazing a trail across Ohio. So, and that was a, a very popular time for people to be thrown into mass graves. So he could be theoretically in a mass grave somewhere as well. <sighs> wow. You just never know. I doubt they would have given his burial a whole lot of respect. Hmm. Wow. So the practice in the day was to turn over executed victims to the churches for burial. Well, his family didn't want him. Um, they nobody from his family showed up to the hanging, um, and so there was nobody to claim the body, and you know the city didn't want it, so they gave it to. He had two Catholic priests that uh, attended uh, to him as a prisoner up until the execution, and so they turned the body over to over to them for burial. Wow! So I gotta ask, did he have last words? And yeah. what were they? Do you know? Oh, it was a rambling. Um, 
it was just rambling. It was a mixture of, you know, I'm guilty. I did it. I deserve this. I'm going home to be with the Lord now. And then he would launch into, you guys are hanging an innocent man. Um, <laughs> so he, it's just, it's a, it's, you can tell his mind was just shattered. He knew what was coming and it's like he was just throwing out whatever he could to see what could stick to change their mind, you know? Um, and nobody, nobody bought it. Um, he probably, it was like a page and a half of what he had left to say. And it probably lasted about five to 10 minutes between him sobbing. And, uh, he did not face death very, uh, <laughs> you know, the kind of man he was, you think he would just, you know, smile and, you know, whatever, hang me. But no, he was, he was extremely scared about what was coming. Wow. I would have been too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they, they left him, they left him hang there for about a half an hour to make sure he was dead. So. Wow. Oh, wow. Legs wasn't kicking anymore. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, now our time's kind of running down um I want to talk a little bit about uh about you you your site your website um is uh haunted toledo yeah yep hauntedtoledo.com yep hauntedtoledo.com and you have a site uh for Paranormal Ohio. Um, there's a lot of people that's members with that. I mean, I, I joined it. I haven't contributed to anything. Or, uh, I, I may have one, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. Uh, but it's very interesting. A lot of people is uh, uh, posting on that site all about Ohio, different haunted places. Um, have yeah. you ever followed up on anything that these people have been saying? Um, no, not, not really. It's the, the paranormal Ohio was just a, a way to try and gather, um, researchers and investigators and just people that enjoy a good ghost story to try and gather them on, into one group and just to share experiences and, and, and talk about the different locations and everything. Um, I, you know, I, some of these people have some very interesting things going on in their own homes that I would be interested in trying to document for them and trying to investigate and, 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 and see if there's any kind of help that can be provided. But one of the things we frown upon in the group is that if somebody says, oh, I, you know, this ghost is bothering me or whatever, or I'm afraid to go to sleep or whatever, we, we've, we kind of frown on people just bugging the hell out of them to let them come investigate. It just seems, it just seems kind of tacky to me. When yes. people do that, yes. Um, so I try not to. Um, yeah, it's a, it, interesting stories, but I, I just gotta I gotta fight the urge to say I would love to go to you know, I'd love to go document this. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh. um, but that's um, yeah. It's just a, it's a it's hopefully it's a fun group that people enjoy going to 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 just meet with other people that are of like mind and. And I think one of the things I really want to accomplish with that group is that I do hear from people that that are living with some kind of phenomena in their home that they can't explain, that they, they want it to stop, they're afraid of it, you know, what have you. Um, but they, they're afraid to say anything because people will make fun of them or that nobody's going to believe them. And one of the things I like about the group is that people can go there and they can read about other people's experiences and they can know that they're not alone. And having these experiences and that um, there are people out there that will listen to them, that, that will give them the benefit of the doubt and that will not make fun of them for what, you know, what they're telling is happening in their house. Um, I think that's important because I think um, to know that you have a, a place to go where you can talk about this stuff and not feel like you're crazy. You know, I think that's important to have a, a forum like that. True, very true. Now, when you're investigating, have, have you been to some of these famous named places to actually investigate? Such um, as, such as uh, like the, Waverly, like places like that. Yeah, we, 
eventually we'll get to those. Um, but for starting out, my my goal was to try and get some of the lesser known locations. Yes. Um, and one of the reasons for that is is you never know when those locations aren't going to exist anymore. And one of the things I want to do is try and and document some of these buildings and these people's experiences before they're lost forever. Um, the Riverside Hospital was a lot of a lot of really cool ghost stories with that building, um, but it, they were they were slated to tear it down, and we fought tooth and nail for like nine months to please let us in there to document this building before you tear it down because once you do it's going to be gone and we finally were able to get two days 14 hours um to film in there and now it's just an empty grass field and when looking at legends and stuff um to me legends are just as important as history uh, history is all the facts and the figures and the names and the places. While the legend, that's like the color, you know. That's uh, that's the flavor of it. So I think it's important to to preserve these these stories as much as it is to preserve history. And like a perfect example of that, because we're never more than a generation away from forgetting these stories if they're not saved. And you, you do hear a lot about, especially in Ohio and probably in the other uh, rest of the country as well, that locations are being lost to developers and highways and they're just falling apart and need to be torn down because they're not safe. So, um, you know, it, it's important to go to like the Waverly Hills and the, the Mansfields and all that to help keep those buildings preserved. Um, but it's also important to go to these lesser known spots and to make sure that we have those stories um, saved for future generations Barbara you guys got some more stuff uh, well I'm just fascinated as and, and I totally agree you really need to preserve what we can um, uh Although it seems like it's interesting to me that when you go back to the hotel, uh, the Wyndham in in your story, that somehow a building which didn't exist uh, at the time of the murder has a haunting on the fourth floor, which probably <laughs> yeah. a building would never have had before, um, even if it had existed back then. Um, you know, it... it it goes back to the psychology of a haunting, uh, and to me, that's, it's one of the subjects that rarely gets addressed is, yes, you're haunting here, but why? Right. Yeah, and uh, uh, Joe Shortridge, uh, he was helping out with that investigation, and he kept saying that all night long. It's like, as far as we can tell, Wingate is the first building to sit on that exact piece of property. Wow. Um, and he, he all night long, he's saying... Why would a ghost be on the fourth floor? And well, I mean, they're they're seeing her everywhere, but predominantly on the fourth floor. I'm like, I, I don't know, Joe. <laughs> I have no clue. That's why we're here. <laughs> but you know, you know, maybe it's it's not because the spirit knows there's a fourth floor or knows to go up the elevator or knows to go up. I mean, maybe. Maybe the spirit gets dragged along because the housekeepers drag her along, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Energy follows energy, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's – that's weird. I mean, there's – there's not – I mean, there's not, there wasn't even a tower there back then. So – and and some of the, the rooms, the, the fourth floor, when they – I said, you know, list off – I asked them to list off all the rooms where they're experiencing stuff. They, they should have just told me the rooms they weren't experiencing stuff because that would have been a shorter list. And some of the places where they're seeing this apparition or they're sensing something um, of some type of figure or the, the guests that stay the night are being awakened by some strange woman walking through the room at night, they all seem to be on the side of the building that overlooks downtown Sylvania. And one of those rooms is like just a 
a straight line, straight view towards where her house used to sit. Oh, um, okay. So maybe, maybe she's keeping an eye on things, or she's keeping an eye out for return, or but I, I don't know. It's it's all guesswork until we really get good EVPs and we can get her to talk. Maybe uh, which I don't, she, I don't. I don't. I don't think she'll talk. Maybe she had to be on the fourth floor to be able to see over the other buildings to see her house. Could be. Yeah, I mean, it, it gives a, a nice bird's eye view of downtown. I and mean, you can see anybody coming. Hmm. Oh, she could be uh, keeping an eye out <laughs> to see if he's coming. <laughs> yeah. And, and for all we know, she still sees things as they were in 1857. Yeah, I believe that. Um, that spirits will see things as they were at the time they lived there or the time period uh, that they come from. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, the other st- go ahead. Is it possible the people that are working there, um, do they come from the, the town itself and how long have their families lived there? I mean, is it possible that they're descendants of people who knew her? I mean, that could be. Um, that could very well be. In, in fact, we met somebody. I mean, in the early days of this investigation, we were up and down Main Street talking to every business owner, every employee we could, um, to ask them if they've experienced anything or if they know the story, just getting a conversation going. And we met somebody that is a direct descendant of Return Ward's family. Um, not of him, but of one of his brothers. And, of course, when I hear that, I'm like salivating to get him on camera. Let's talk about this. And they're like, no, 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 no. They don't want nobody to know. Hmm. Um, so it's it's really, it's a story that, if you talk to the old timers, they remember hearing the story when they were kids. And then, like, I didn't hear the story when I grew up there. And it just it got forgotten until the, uh, Gay Gindy came out with her book about the murder. And now people remember it again. Um, so it's almost like these legends skip generations. Um, but yeah, it's, there are still some people there that remember the story. And they, they just, either they talk about it or they don't like to talk about it. One of the two. Gotcha. But time, when I grew, up, I grew up in Sylvania, I never knew... I bought comic books off a spinner rack that was maybe 10 feet away from the murder scene. Didn't even know it. Oh, wow. Um, Reve Salon used to be an antique store that I went in to buy comic books from. Didn't even know the place was haunted. I mean, it's just weird that all these years later, I'm coming back to these buildings, and I'm like, and I have no out. idea this store even existed. All right. Our, our time is just about run out. Um, I do want to thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Everybody in the chat room enjoyed the show. And um, I want you to tell everybody how they can follow you and all your websites and uh, contacts and um, stay on till after we're off. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for, for having me on the, on the program. Um, hopefully all your questions were answered. Um, HauntedToledo.com is a a website that I'm working on uh, right now, putting content up. Um, But we also have uh, the Facebook page, Haunted Toledo, where I I do most of the posting, uh, most of the announcements at. Um, And then the YouTube channel, which is uh, uh, also called Haunted Toledo. And we'll be putting out a ton of investigation videos uh, this spring where from, from 2017 on up to the present, um, all the different places we've been. And we are also uh, working on producing a Legends of the Heartland TV series for uh, PBS that we intend to put on PBS. Uh, we've got five episodes filmed uh, right now, and we had to film episode six in two weeks. And we intend to have it on, on the air by September, October. Uh, I, it'll be shown locally in the Toledo market, but there'll also be an option that can help it go national to okay. other affiliates. Christopher, we got um, we got to jump off. I want to thank you. So okay. stay stay on till after we get off. And uh, this is Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gold, and Barbara Duncan. 
See you next week uh, at the same time. You've been listening to The Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of The Paranormal View.